So I have to apologize right at the outset uh, because I did write a sermon. I did. I think I did. Uh, but I also kind of like wrote one right before services too. And um, he, here's the reason why. I, I originally wrote a sermon, but it was like four to five years ago almost. <laughs> Um, see, there's, I'm going to let you in on a, a little trade secret. Uh, Mike, I'm going to tell him our trade secret. So preachers will sometimes re-preach old sermons, okay? Um, because why not? You know, I mean, do you even remember the last thing I talked about last time I was up here? <laughs> right? Like, I don't remember the last thing I talked about, you know? And so sometimes in order to make work a little bit easier, we'll just kind of dust one off, you know? And I think one of the reasons why I was doing that is because... Um, I wanted to end 2023 by talking about the life of Jesus. And so if last time I was in the pulpit, we talked about the crux of the cross and the crucifixion from that weird passage where Paul explains about him defeating the principalities and the powers through his death on the cross, then I'm just going to kind of work backwards, right? And so we're going to talk about this instance in the life of Jesus today with the rich young ruler, which... I'll let you guess where I'm going to go on December 24th, right, as we wrap up this uh, uh, series of lessons, I guess, on the life of Jesus. But as I was looking through this sermon, I even sent the outline to Linda, right? Like, it's in your bulletin. I, I knew what I was going to talk about. But the more I read through it, I was just like, this doesn't sit right. You know, and I even went back and tried to listen to the sermon, and it was just like, who is that in the pulpit? Ooh, you know, it's like, do you ever get those uh, reminders on Facebook of something you posted three years ago, and you're just like cringeworthy, right? It's like, who is that guy? I don't recognize this person. And that's the funny thing of what I realize is that I've been here eight years. You guys have had, do you realize, eight different preachers, and they've all been me. <laughs> like... I don't recognize who I was. So no matter, no matter how hard I tried, I was not going to be able to re-preach the sermon as is. And then it made me realize as I was looking at this text that that's kind of, that's kind of a sort of a, a parable about the text itself. Because the story that we're considering today, I have my Bible open to Mark chapter 10 if you'd like to join me. The story that we're going to consider today is a story that's all famous. Maybe you're familiar with it because you've been in church before about the rich young ruler. But it's interesting because it's not just told by one preacher. It's not told by eight. But it's not just told by two. It's, it's told by three different preachers. It's told by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's one of those stories we call uh, a story that's found in the synoptic gospels. We call them synoptic gospels because they're told by all of the gospel preachers except for John, right? It's mentioned over and over again. Now, one of the interesting questions you can ask is, what is so important about this story, about the rich young ruler who falls at the feet of Jesus, asking the question about how he can be saved, uh, in essence, why is it so important that it's mentioned by three different preachers? But I think the more interesting question is, three of them told it, but they're all kind of a different story. That we have these stories written in the four different Gospels, or the three different Gospels there, but, but they're all told slightly differently. And what can each of their separate perspectives lend us as we try to understand this story? I thought that was even a more interesting question. Now, one of the ways that N.T. Wright brought this to me is he talks about how sometimes people will mention how you can't trust the Gospels. Because we do have, in fact, three, you know, four different accounts about the life of Jesus. And sometimes these stories have different details, right? But he said something really interesting. He said, for example, if there was a car crash at this, I mean, God forbid, at this roundabout at 300 and Dan Jones, okay? And three different people came up to you saying three different accounts and three different details about this car crash, one would not immediately conclude no crash happened they would conclude something did happen and we should get to the bottom of what actually happened, right? And so, likewise, when this rich young ruler comes to the feet of Jesus and asks this question and Jesus gives him his famous answer, it doesn't mean nothing happened, that their stories are different, but why are the stories different? And so, what I want to do is, first of all, I just want to go through the story from Mark chapter 10, his account is the one I prefer, and then, at the end, I want to bring up the parallel accounts, and what is different in each, and how does it lend insight to how we read this story? Does that make sense? 
Okay, maybe this is winning, okay? This is not going to be a complete disaster. All right, so Mark chapter 10, let's jump into the story and see if this will uh, illuminate our minds a little bit. Mark chapter 10, and I'm going to start reading in verse, let's see here, verse 17. So hear God's word. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt uh, before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. And disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Verse 23, and Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter into the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. And Peter began to say to him, see, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sister or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. And this is God's word. If you would, bow your heads with me and let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we bless your holy name, and we are so thankful for our Messiah, the Christ, our Lord, who came to this world, took on flesh, uh, became incarnate, manifested your glory, lived among the people, and taught them what it meant to seek the gospel. Father, as we go through this story where... Jesus audits this young man. We pray that you would help us to be exceedingly mindful of our own lives, to see it as a mirror, that uh, we might be able to meditate on what you have to say to us today. Father, please open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to receive what you have prepared for us and enlighten our minds. Help us to understand why this story was repeated so often and what insight it can lend for us today. We love you, and we pray that you help us to lead a life of repentance, seeking after the kingdom. Help us to be allegiant to Christ Jesus, our Lord. We pray this in Jesus' holy name, and amen. All right, so first things first. Let's get the brass tacks of the story in play, right? Try to understand uh, basically what's going on with the story. And then we're going to consider the differences in the storytelling from Matthew, uh, then Luke, and then finally Mark once again. All right, so... This guy comes up, and he walks to Jesus, and he asks him a question. What must I do, good teacher, to inherit eternal life? And there's a sense in which Jesus sort of already gave an answer to this, right? At least in the big picture of what Mark is trying to tell his audience. Now, he's presenting this gospel presentation about this Messiah. And Jesus already told the people around what you needed to do to follow him. All right, so look over in Mark chapter 8. This is what Jesus tells people generally. And you can't help but wonder if this young man knew this general call, right? And so Jesus is talking to the disciples, Mark chapter 8, just a few uh, passages previous to this. And it says in verse 34, in calling the crowd uh, with him, uh, to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Which for them was a very, this isn't just a, Uh, you know, a a metaphorical burden. I mean, the cross carried real Roman implications, right, when he's talking to them. Let him take his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? 
For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I think we're familiar with this general gospel call, right? I found it interesting as I was reading this. Um, I, I never noticed that he calls them a, an adulterous generation. But what does he mean by that? Now, he, he doesn't mean that they're literally going out sleeping with someone who's not their spouse. He's calling me adulterous because these are individuals who are so much more in love with the world that they're forsaking God. They love God. They love the goods of God more than God himself, right? Good things rather than God things. And that's what makes them adulterous, that they're choosing the world more than God. And so that's the general call. But what's interesting is that I want you to see this young man who falls at the feet of Jesus as a specific application where Jesus, in this case study, looks at his life, in a sense does an audit, and gives him exactly what he needs to hear in that moment. So this young man comes up and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And notice what he goes on to say in Mark chapter 10 and in verse, in particular, uh, verse 19. Jesus says, listen, <laughs> we both grew up with the same scriptures, buddy. You, you know the commandments. You know them. And he goes on to explain the sixth commandment, the seventh commandment, the eighth commandment, the ninth commandment. Now, follow along. Where do we expect him to go after that? Six, seven, eight, nine. The tenth commandment, right? But he doesn't say that. He doesn't say the tenth commandment. Why? What is the tenth commandment? You shall not covet, covet, yes, covet, desire someone else's life. Why? Because this is the rich young ruler. He has the life everybody wants. He has the life that everybody desires. So Jesus is, in a sense, t this is a tailor-made invitation for this specific guy at this moment in time, right? This guy isn't struggling with coveting. He has everything. But then what's interesting is that Jesus is clearly quoting the Ten Commandments, and he jumps back up to the fifth. But don't you also think if he's going to enter into this life, he should also have mentioned the other commandments? When we think about the Ten Commandments, we think about them as like two tablets, right? And so we think about the Decalogue, and, and some preachers have, have described it this way. We have this sort of vertical commandments, the ones that are aimed at God and is about our relationship with him. So behold, Israel, I'm the one who brought you out of slavery, out of Egypt, on eagle's wings to myself. You're my people, therefore no other gods, right? And he goes on saying don't even craft an image after anything in the air or in the sea or on the ground. And, and he talks about, you know, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain and remember the Sabbath day. Don't you think he should have mentioned those commandments as well if you're going to enter into life? Aren't those the big kahunas, the big ones, the ones about our relationship with God? He doesn't mention them. Or does he? Or does he? And this is where I think maybe it sort of gets into a little bit of a lesson of, of idolatry, actually. Because in place of those other commandments about God, I want to suggest to you Jesus offers his own rendition of it with what he says in Mark chapter 10 and in verse 21. When he tells them, you lack one thing. Take your riches sell them, give to the poor, and then come and follow me. I believe Jesus is, in a sense, saying those four commandments with this one commandment, go sell your riches, because Jesus knew where this guy's heart really lied, what he actually valued, right? He looked at him specifically in that moment, took an audit and said, that's, that's your God. You know, there's a story, uh, an anecdote that's often given about uh, if you want to catch a monkey, right? Have you heard this one before? If you want to catch a monkey, what you have to do is you get like a glass bottle and you fill that glass bottle with a bunch of rocks and stuff and make the hole like just large enough that a monkey can kind of like put his hand in, right? And then you put a big old fat banana on top. And along comes a monkey and a monkey will come in and put his hand into the glass bottle and he'll grab that banana. But the glass bottle's so heavy, he can't begin to even move around, right? And that monkey, because he has that death grip on that banana, will not, I mean, he just, he, he's not going anywhere. And that's how you catch a monkey. That, in a sense, is what Jesus is seeing with this rich guy. 
He can't even value his life enough. Whoever saves his life will lose it, right? He can't even value his life enough that he will let go of what is bringing him down, the weight, to have what lies in front of him. No, but Jesus, I really do want to follow you. Tell, tell me, what can I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, hey, you really want to be a part of my disciples? You want to follow me? Go sell what you have. Give to the poor. Come follow me. And he can't do it. Or at least he doesn't do it immediately. The Bible doesn't tell us what he does. But he doesn't do it immediately. He goes away sorrowful, the text tells us, right? And then Jesus gives the famous illustration. Now, I, I think it was kind of interesting. Jesus actually gives us a little bit of a, a director's cut on what he means, okay? Look at verses 29 and 30. If you want to know Jesus' commandment to this young man, the director's cut's kind of in verse 29. He says, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time house and brothers and mothers and <laughs> children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. That's an extension of what he's saying. Now, what I find so revolutionary about what Jesus is actually saying in the story to this young man, and a lot of people have seen um, an echo of what Jesus is saying in verse 29 with a story in the Old Testament. Jesus is actually, there's evidence Jesus is echoing a story from the book of Ruth. In Ruth, Ruth chapter 2, in verses 11, uh, 11 and 12, what do we know about Ruth? Ruth is this Moabite. Her family has died. We know that her mother-in-law is going to go back to the land of Israel. And what's interesting is that Ruth makes this weird decision to leave the gods of the Moabites, and she says to Naomi, her mother, she says, your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and where you're buried, I will be buried. And it's a declaration that I'm going to let go of my lands and my things, and I'm going to adopt yours. And in that moment, she pledges allegiance to Yahweh. It's the same thing with what Jesus is teaching this young man here. Now, what's interesting and what's revolutionary about what Jesus is teaching is that Jesus, in a sense, is equating the first four commandments about no other gods before Yahweh and dedication to the God of Israel with leaving everything for the sake of the gospel and following Jesus. In a sense, do you know what it means to be faithful to the God of Israel? It's to follow Jesus as the Messiah. That's what it means to be faithful to the God of Israel. And then he gives the illustration in verses 23 to 27, basically conjuring up the largest thing in the Jewish mind at that time that they could conceive of, a camel and the smallest opening, and how it's absolutely impossible. But good news, whatever is impossible with man is possible with God. And then uh, the disciples have two responses. Number one, who can be saved, right? Because in the Jewish mind, I mean, they thought about Jabez. They thought about Job. They thought about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When you're righteous and you fulfill the law and you do good things, then riches come your way, right? So what are you talking about? The rich can't be saved. It just blew their minds. And then secondly, well, Peter says, look at us, Jesus. We left everything to follow you, man. And that's essentially the story. Now, as we think about this story, I now want to point out to what I think are the crucial differences in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that can help transform the way we read it, okay? Let's go to the first one, and that's found in Matthew chapter 19. So if you want to follow along, I'll go ahead and beckon you to turn to Matthew chapter 19. I think the way that this story transforms in Matthew's mind is by telling us to go back to the question in Matthew chapter 19. Now, I don't know what you think of whenever you think about the question of the rich man, but what exactly did he ask? What was his question to Jesus, right? What was the million-dollar question that he brought before the Lord whenever he decided that he wanted to follow him? He says here, uh, Matthew chapter 19, Teacher, what good deed must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, how, what does that mean to you? Because this question means something totally different to me now than what I, I thought it originally meant. Jesus is not saying, hey, or this man is not saying, hey, what thing, good deed can I do so that when I die, I can go be with God in heaven? That's not what he's asking. That's not the perspective that a Jew would have brought to that question. That's not 
uh, evidence shows us now, that's not what he was thinking when he's asking Jesus' question. What good thing can I do so that whenever I'm dead, I don't go to hell, I go get to be in heaven with you forever? That's not what he's asking. The Jew thought of that question very, very differently. There's evidence that whenever they ask this question, they're talking about their belief of the Olam Haba, their belief of the world to come, the kingdom that God was promising to bring literally translated eternal life is life in the world to come or life in the new age. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's asking about. He's saying, how can I accept God's rule, God's kingdom, God's reign in my life now? That's how they were thinking about this question when they asked Jesus. And I think it's an important distinction to make because remember the Bible is a this worldly book. It is. God creates the heavens and the earth. God calls the heavens and the earth good. The first job he gives to mankind is to build civilization. That's what they see there. Matter of fact, we're told all throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, there's nothing better for a man to do under the sun than to eat, drink, and be merry, right? That, th that he, should, he should rejoice in the work that God has given him. They, they were concerned about the things that God had created and that God had given. They didn't view this world as evil and needing to be escaped. They saw this world as corrupted and needing to be transformed. That's the way they saw it. And so this guy sees Jesus doing this work, and he says, I want to be a part of that. Now, if you read that question that way, the correct way, it'll transform everything Jesus begins to say to this man. Oh, you want to be a part of that kingdom? You want to be a part of that reign of God? You want to enter into that life now? You want to pray God, your name be hallowed, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven now? Then go sell what you got. Give to the poor. You'll have riches in heaven. I'm not denying there's a heaven. You'll have riches in heaven and come and follow me. And you will get fourfold in this life now what you have given up. That's what Jesus tells him. And I think it's important to see this, and here's why. There's a famous quote by Karl Marx. And it's a pretty good quote, even though I disagree with like 99.99999% of everything he wrote, right? Communist Manifesto. But he did say this good thing. Karl Marx is a tribute from saying this very famous phrase, religion is the opium of the people, or religion is the opiate of the people. And what he meant by that is that religion has the potential of so anesthetizing you, of so doling your senses with the promise of an afterlife that it makes you forget to do earthly good now. Have you ever heard the phrase that some people have their heads so far up in the clouds, so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good? Have you ever heard that? That's what we're talking about. The question is important because that's what this guy is asking. How can I be a part of that now? And Jesus gives them a very specific answer of how he can continue and do that work now. That's what he can do. Praying, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So why does Matthew help us think about it in that way? Because notice how Matthew tells the story in Matthew 19 and verse 28. Jesus, right after this young man, Jesus goes on to say this. In Matthew 19 and verse 28. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, in the new world, ESV. Some of your translations say, in the regeneration, in the new world, in the restoration of things, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sister or father or mother or children's or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. That's the unique contribution that Matthew gives us and how he understood it as a Jew writing to Jews for this question to be a part of the life of the age to come. Here's the second one. Now we're going to skip ahead to Luke's gospel. And I want to show you something unique that Luke does. Now, Luke, what he does is I think he actually elucidates what the point that we're supposed to take away is. Now, there was an old rabbi who was a polemicist against Christianity in the 16th century. 
His name was Rabbi Yitzhak of Troika. His real name. And he wrote what is the most comprehensive argument of Jews against Christianity that we have today, okay? Now, in his argument, he said, because this was a popular belief of the day, he said, okay, you Christians say that following Jesus is so much easier than Judaism because Jesus says, my yoke is light and my burden is not heavy, right? So it's so much easier to follow him than following Moses. But don't you know that Moses only told us to give a tithe? Look what Jesus says to do. He tells this young man, go sell everything you got and give to the poor. Who can live that way? As if the takeaway is that everybody in the universe who has ever crossed paths with Jesus is meant to sell everything they have and give to the poor. Is that the point? That's not the point, right? You missed it. That's not the point. And here's proof from the book of Luke. Now, Luke does something really interesting. Luke likes to talk about riches. He likes to talk about money. In Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 30, he tells the story of the rich young ruler. But then he follows it up with a story of another rich man in Luke chapter 19. It's almost like Luke wants us to compare and contrast these stories, to do this side by side. Now, Dylan just read the text, so I'm not going to read it for the sake of time today, but it's the story of the wee little man, right? Little Zacchaeus. Get out of that sycamore tree. <laughs> He's in that tree. He's looking at Jesus. Jesus comes up to him and says, I'm going to your house today, or I'm going to your house today. <laughs> and they go to his house, and the Bible tells us that, that Zacchaeus is not just a rich man, okay? He is very rich. He is the arch tax collector in the Greek. He is the chief of tax collectors. He has all the money. And when Jesus sits down at his table, the Bible tells us that Zacchaeus says not only will he give half of his goods, but if he has defrauded anyone, he's going to restore that to them in accordance with the law. And do you know what Jesus says? Jesus doesn't say, what a joke. I just saw this rich young ruler the other day, man. And <laughs> Well, actually, we don't know if he actually sold everything or not, do we? But he told him to sell everything. Notice he doesn't say that to the arch tax collector. This tax collector said, out of his own conviction, I'll give away half of my goods, which is still a lot, and if I've defrauded anyone, I'll restore that. And notice what Jesus says. Salvation has come to this house. Because you know what the difference was between the rich young ruler and the arch tax collector Zacchaeus? Where was their joy? Jesus tells him, sell what you got. That guy walks away crestfallen, sad. Where was his joy? Zacchaeus gets an opportunity to follow Jesus, and in his joy sells what he has to make up for whatever he's defrauded and half of his goods to help the poor, and he is beaming. Where's his joy? Where's his God? What does he serve? Now, I say that because I don't want anyone thinking that the point is that you got to sell everything you got. Now, it might be for somebody. I don't know. I don't know what Jesus has told you. But but I do want you to do this. I do want you to do an audit upon your life. And I want to ask you a very difficult question. Whenever we think about what Jesus might have to say to us, I want to word it this way. If Jesus took an audit upon your life today, what would he say to you? Where is your joy located? Here's a way we can find out where that is. Number one, What in your life causes you to overwork to achieve it? Now, this is going to be different for everybody, but what in your life causes you to overwork to achieve it? Secondly, what in your life provides you inordinate fear if it is threatened? Number three, deep anger if it is blocked. And number four, inconsolable despair if it is lost. What in your life causes you to overwork to achieve it, inordinate fear if threatened, deep anger if blocked, and inconsolable despair if it is lost? Is that in competition? You have to be honest now. I can't tell you that. Is it in competition with the call of the gospel to follow Christ? That might be something that Jesus uses as he thinks about the ways we are weighted down similarly today. And lastly, let's go back to Mark's gospel. 
if Matthew lends insight into this story by providing us the real basis for the question, if Luke provides us insight by telling us what exactly is the point, namely that it's a little bit different for everybody, then Mark tells us what the heart of this story is. And that is found in a single verse in Mark chapter 10 and verse 21. I want to read it to you again. The unique detail that Mark gives us when he tells the story is this. And Jesus, looking at him and loving him well, and loving him well, said to him, you lack one thing. You lack one thing. Go and sow what you have. Give to the poor. And come and follow me. I don't know why Mark included that in his story. I, I don't know. But did you notice the difference? None of us, none of the other stories tell us that Jesus' disposition toward this young man. That he looked at him, that he took a moment to actually connect and empathize with this young man and to love him well, at least telling us that Jesus isn't being a jerk here. He's not, he's not being abrasive deliberately. He's not giving this guy something so hard that he, he can't do it. He is answering this guy's question for what it is. He's telling him what he needs to hear. He's, he's giving him an out from the weight that bears him down. He sees him on a human level, looking at him and loving him, tells him you lack one thing. I can't help but think, and this is just my opinion, I can't help but think that Jesus saw himself in this young man. Because isn't Jesus also kind of like a rich young ruler? I mean, think about it. The Bible has certain passages like 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, which tells us that you know the grace of God that uh, Jesus, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you by his poverty might become rich. That Jesus left, right, his place with God to incarnate, to manifest, to be with us. We get wondrous Christian hymns and poems like Philippians chapter 2, if you wouldn't mind turning your Bibles there along with me. Philippians chapter 2 that try to depict cosmically what Jesus has done for us by coming to earth and saving us. Think of it like a rich young ruler who had to sell all that he had to do this mission. Philippians chapter 2 and beginning in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or exploited or used as a trump card, but instead emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." And therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. I think Jesus saw himself in this man and told him what he needed to hear. And I think that's the heart of this story. I don't know where we go from here because that's as far as I wrote this morning. <laughs> but hopefully that's been sufficient. We're going to take this moment now and give it over to silent reflection and prayer and meditate on what this might mean for us. Uh, this might be a moment where you recognizing the call of Christ and the one who gave himself, emptied himself, that he might save you, that he might take your place on the cross, that he might bear you up, that he might uh, remit your sins. When you think about the good news of Jesus Christ, you might want to be baptized. We have the ability to do that. Maybe you want the prayers of this church, or maybe this is a moment for you individually to take this moment with God and just pray, just ask, just seek, uh, inquire uh, to his help. I don't know what it is, but if this text spoke to you today, um, I watch the clock. Take this moment to be still before God.
Our Father in heaven, we come to you from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, recognizing how you have unified us by your Holy Spirit through the blood of Christ into one body. Father, help us to renew conviction in our allegiance to Christ and to consider the call placed before us to do good in this world. To pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done, beginning here in Brownsburg. And help us to join in whatever call Jesus places before us, whatever convictions lie before us, to do good in this world now, to mind our own business and to seek holiness and to pursue it. Father, give us the strength to glorify Christ in our lives. Help us to do so in our family, in our workplace, in the community, in our schools, and in this church. Father, we love you for the gospel and for the love that Jesus Christ has for us all. Be patient with us as we grow, but we're thankful for your word, and we hold fast to it. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. And amen. This time I